Hey everybody, this is Bob Goodwin and welcome to another episode of Career Club LinkedIn Live. I am really excited about today's episode when we get to our guests here in just a minute. But first, if you haven't uh, checked out Career Club, please do. You can find us at career.club where we're using proven sales and marketing tools to help people find a career that matters to them. Uh, this is a live event, so uh, as we go, please let us know where you're calling in from. Uh, and obviously, use the comment section to ask any questions that you'd like to ask our guests today. Uh, this is going to be a very, very fun session, so uh, participation points are going to be uh, awarded. Uh, I also want to quickly say thank you to my colleague, Joy Pace, who is the magic that makes this whole thing happen. So without further ado, I would like to welcome our guests onto the call. Let's see if we can make technology be our friend. All Almost. Right. There we go. Oh, come on. There we go. <laughs> so, there, yeah, we did it. So thank you, Joey. Um, but seriously, I'd like to welcome our guests. So these are three of the six authors, collectively known as the Band of Sisters, of the new book that is phenomenal. You should smile more. And so with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Lori Marcus, Katie Lacey, and C. Nicholson. Ladies, welcome. Thank, thank you. you. Awesome. So as is our habit here on our LinkedIn Lives, uh, just a little bit of an icebreaker. So Katie, I'll pick on you first. Uh, yeah. So where were you born and raised and where are you calling in from today? Well, that's an easy one. Uh, I was born and raised, I was born in Washington, D.C. and raised in the Virginia suburbs outside of Washington. And I have lived in New York City for the last 26 years. Oh, my goodness. And just uh, kind of a, a very brief career arc for you so people can kind of get grounded. Sure. I, um, I, I went to business school and kept coming out of business school. My first job was at PepsiCo, where I spent uh, the most formative years of my career and part of the reason I'm here today, and then went to ESPN. And from there, um, did a really kind of what you would expect. I went and ran a stationary company. Of course. Um, yeah, where else would you go? As one does. Uh -huh. And, uh, and then <laughs> since, since then, I've been um, uh, serving on a board and working with the Band of Sisters. Very, very cool. C, welcome. Thank you. Okay, born and raised, and where are you today? Chicago is where I was born and raised. I went to school out in the Midwest, and then I've been in the Northeast since 1997. Actually, Pepsi brought me out to the East Coast. I'm now calling from the Upper West Side uh, uh, in Manhattan. Um, and so, and for my kind of career, I like spent, I spent 11 years at Pepsi. I was the chief market officer where I left. And then I went on to a couple other chief market roles, worked for Equinox. In the fitness category, I was in the fintech space uh, and, and a startup that eventually got bought by Google. And now I'm doing a lot of um, uh, working with startups and advising, and I'm a, a couple of board of directors. And that obviously oh, the biggest interest. Very cool. And Lori, welcome. Hi, everybody. Um, I was born and raised in New Jersey, so I apologize in advance if I say you guys, you guys, or <laughs> any of that. I live in uh, Southern Connecticut now, although I'm also on the Upper West Side today. Um, quick career story. So three chapters. First chapter, largely at PepsiCo. I was there for 24 years. That's a long time. Uh, second chapter of my career was as a chief marketing officer, more in direct to consumer industries, mm -hmm. retail, Cura Green Mountain, and then at Peloton in its early days. And then for about six years now, I've been in a portfolio career and three parts to that, uh, serving on corporate boards, doing executive coaching, and then the Band of Sisters is my third pillar. Yeah, very cool. So obviously Pepsi is a theme, and we'll kind of break that down in just a second. Yeah. Now, I skipped over one thing that's always fun. Katie, what do we find you doing when you're not at work and doing Band of Sisters stuff? I do a lot of walking, some of it with C, um, around, around Central Park. I play golf, I cook, and I travel. Very cool. And uh, where's the next spot on your travel list? Um, well, Boston, but that doesn't really count. I'm going to Vienna and Prague in the spring. Ah, now we're talking. That sounds like that. Yeah, yeah. See, what are you doing when you're not uh, at work? I'm doing handstands. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm on a 20 year quest to do handstands all over the world. It started in 2015 when I was 50. I'm eight years in. I'm going to do them till I'm 70. You can follow me on Instagram. I do them all over. I'm, I'm kind of nuts about it. And so really, it's actually probably the only interesting thing about me is my handstands. Oh, stop. So, so where, where the heck did that come from? Well, actually, when I left uh, kind of corporate America in 2015, I went on a, a, a month journey with a friend out west. We went to all these national parks and we were trying to be entertained to our friends and not just do the same boring picture with our arms around each other saying, we're in Utah, we're in Colorado. So it was also, I started doing, I started 
do, I did a handstand. I'm like, gosh, I'm surprisingly okay at this. Anyways, and so that I just I just started doing them everywhere. <laughs> if you so, want to be a brand, do something different, right? Right, right, right. So yeah. So anyway, so I do them everywhere. I just did my holiday one, which I'll be posting shortly. I'm very excited about it. It has some sparkly lights. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've seen a, I've seen a draft. It's very good. <laughs> <laughs> I know what my next Instagram follow is going to be. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. If you're going to follow one of us, follow C. Don't follow me. Uh, basically, what I do when I'm not working is I'm up at the crack of dawn eating M&Ms and working out on my Peloton bike or running uh, here mm. in Central Park. And um, when I'm not doing that, I uh, when I'm not working, I love to go to Broadway shows. I think I have literally mm. seen everything that there is to see. So that's my top three favorite part. shows. Top three oh, favorite okay. shows. Um, I, so I'll go, so recently, um, so, I mean, Hamilton is kind of an obvious one. Uh, love that. We recently saw Chicago, uh, again, hadn't seen that in years and it never, uh, sort of never disappoints. And then, um, I'll just do a recent one that I think is excellent is six. Um, it's about the six wives of Henry the eighth, super short hour and a half, just kind of a, like a big musical, all women, women in the band. Excellent, excellent. So good, I saw it twice. And then Strange Loop, I'll throw that one in as well. Okay, bonus one, awesome, very cool. Yes. Uh, so let's, let's dive into this. So for folks who don't know, uh, tell us a little bit about who the Band of Sisters are, and then use that as a segue into the book, You Should Smile More and Why You Guys Wrote That. So I'll let you guys I'll, orchestrate. I'll, I'll, I'll start, I'll start. So obviously, as you could tell by our, our interview, introductions we have a big pepsi overlay so there's six of us three obviously re representing three of us today and we from the late 80s to about 2016 we were at pepsi we all overlapped for about a decade so for a real important part of our career we were all in c-suite in some capacity we went then went on to become run paper companies and go to we were at NFL and we uh, we we're at ESPN, Equinox, BlackRock. So we all had much, you know, other chapters uh, that we're in the middle of right now. A lot of us are now um, on board. So we kind of went from the, you know, the, the bottom run all the way to the board boardroom with the with uh, Pepsi being a very formative part of it. Mm. And then we uh, have stayed connected and, and, and been always very supportive of each other. And then we wrote a book that was actually launched in September of this year, which is what's the, obviously the one you just held up. Yeah. So Katie, you want to uh, maybe start off with just a little bit of why you guys decided to write the book? Yeah. So, you know, um, we got together, it was in 2019, and it was a little bit of a just kind of a reconnect. It was a larger group of women talking about, um, you know, just kind of where we'd been, what we've been doing. And as tends to happen, some stories started to get shared. And, you know, there was a little bit of a feeling of, wow, you know, I kind of, it have things changed? That was one of the first questions that Lori actually had brought up. She was she had founded, was a founding member of the first women's resource network at Pepsi in 1993, I think it was. And, he, and so here it was, you know, almost 30 years later, and we we're getting the sense that things had not changed. Um, you know, sometimes as you move beyond it, you don't realize it as much. But as we started really talking to younger women, um, obviously close to daughters, nieces, and what they were encountering, we realized that this we just we the, the the we could not check the box this this was the work was not done and that we had something to offer to the conversation mm -hmm. um and what we really honed in on was it's the it's these little things it's these little things that add up day in day out and they're the things that happen they're the micro moments the microaggressions whatever you want to call them that sometimes feel too small too petty um but then they add up and they create this they create a wall. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's where we really wanted to focus was bringing awareness and attention to those. And we felt like we had a unique perspective given that trajectory. I mean, C talked about everywhere we've been, we counted it up. We've been in 29 industries. We've, oh been, at every, we've been at every level and we're not one person with one point of view. We're six people with six different ways of handling things, six lenses on very similar situations and different reactions to them. So we felt like we had 
Um, we had been there, we were still there, we could talk about it, but we could also, importantly, we could talk very practically about it. And that- yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute, Katie, because I think this practicality that you guys take is really, really important. Something that definitely struck me about the book. Lori, if, if the book is super successful, you know, what changes happen? How, how would we know? Yeah. So I think the thing that's interesting, as Katie mentioned, we focus on these micro moments, microaggressions. Some people call them accidental acts of sexism. Whatever you call them doesn't matter. Um, but we hope that we are starting a conversation on this. And then given that we are we're operating executives by background, what we hope is that we can give really practical advice to women who experience this, to um, bystanders in the room of any gender turning bystanders into allies, and then also for bosses of any gender. So what we feel like, and we use storytelling and we use humor and we're super, super practical, is that we can actually get people to be, it's kind of as a marketer, right? Like awareness trial, repeat, depth of repeat. <laughs> so we can, at first we can make people aware that these things are happening give practical tools for how to make them happen less often. And so what we're hoping that we can do is the, the answer to these micro moments are these little micro solutions. So literally in every meeting that you were in, if you're aware of it, as a bystander, you can see something and you can say something as a boss, you can other people less often. And as a woman, when you experience these things, you can then react to them with the right words and actions in the moment. So we're hoping we can actually start a movement of just like one little thing at the time is getting people aware of this and making very small changes that can have very big impact. Yeah. Well, yeah, one thing that was, was interesting, I just want to add is that we, you know, we, we obviously ran across all these situations and we had plenty of conversation, but we wanted to figure out if it was still happening today. So we went out and did mm -hmm. primary research with hundreds of uh, younger women. And besides looking at the academic research and anything that we talk about or anything in our book is actually still happening today. And, and I think one of the really interesting points was that, um, that for, for me was that to see that younger women were actually in some cases uh, felt uh, less equipped to be able to deal with some of the stuff they're going to handle the work workplace because the fact that they thought some of these issues were th that they didn't think they were going to run into them or they thought they were solved. Whereas in our generation, uh, when we went through, we had pretty low expectations because our business school classes were all men and like the people that ran all the groups were men and the men were all the power positions. And so we just kind of, you know, kind of fit in. And and I think that younger women today, I mean, you mentioned you have, you, had a, you have a daughter that's, you know, a recent grad. She went through girl power. They controlled everything. They're like they title nine. They were do, getting great grades, going to great schools, graduated higher rates. They think they have the world by the tail and they get into the workplace. And some of these same things of like, hey, Susan, will you take the notes or being over talked or you know handling more of the housework or the on and on and on all these things are still happening but they actually didn't see it coming we we saw it coming so i thought that was interesting <laughs> well you know so and it's kind of to the point that it's still happening now one of the things that hopefully is encouraging but but still i think highlights that there's a, a gap yet is you know, 41 of the Fortune 500 CEOs are now women. So that's okay. really good. That's, I think, um, it's only 8%, which is not really good, but it's double what it was six years ago. So, you know, some progress is being made. It's probably the beauty of a low base, right? You guys are all used to using numbers. So it's a 100% increase, yeah, of a right. crappy number. So, you know, we're, we're slightly less crappy. But, <laughs> Now, at the same time, now you guys are all on boards. We've talked about that. Yeah. And, and a statistic that I found says that 35% of board members now are women. But last mm -hmm. time I checked, 51% of the population in the U.S. are women. So mm -hmm. why, why is there still this you know, very significant disparity? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think we could have a probably a seven week conversation about this, <laughs> right? I mean, so it's a, it's a pretty hard one to boil down. I'll, I'll tell you. It, it makes me so frustrated to look at those numbers because we are not just starting out, right? Like this is, we are decades in the making of women en masse coming into the workforce. So I, it is to me the fact that 41 
Fortune 500 women's our CEOs is so unacceptable, it makes me angry. Um, mm -hmm. One of the best sources, I think, for the data and some of the drivers out there is the McKinsey study, the mm -hmm. annual study they do about women in the workplace. They've been doing it for a long time. And the thing they talk about is this broken rung at manager. Mm -hmm. And it makes so much sense to me. It's that first job or that first promotion where you know women young women and young men are coming into the workplace at the same rate and then but you get to that first kind of defining managerial position and men are getting promoted at a higher rate and boy you just start you multiply that out over the years and and the math is pretty obvious and one of the key things that you learn and i can look back and like i mean we're all wired to think like this. I mean, even as women, we have to deprogram ourselves sometimes. But that idea that men are based on potential and women are based are promoted based on performance is huge. And it's just so baked in, I think. And it could be like, OK, we're sitting here. You and I both started the company at the same time. And it's like, Bob, Bob, you know, whether it's conscious or unconscious, Bob looks like me. Bob, you know, grew up in the same place. He went to, he knows my brother. Like Bob's got presence. Bob is, I can see where Bob's going. Let's promote Bob. Bob's a fast tracker. Katie, Katie seems good. She hit her numbers. She's a good team leader. Let's give her another year of seasoning. And you feel like you're doing Katie a favor because you've acknowledged that she's good. So mm -hmm. like, but that happens day in, day out. And that sets it up. So I think that is, that. I can see that scenario happening across the country, across every company, and that adds up to a huge difference. And then you don't have you don't have a pool. And part of that then, and then I'll stop, um, is mm -hmm. I think companies focus so much on recruiting and especially when they look, oh my God, I've got this gap. And so then they're out kind of like everybody's searching for that same small pool of people because only a certain number of women have gotten there. Um, and what we really want to emphasize is the need to focus on retention. You've got them all coming in. They're coming in at 50-50. So why aren't they moving up at the same rate? And I think companies need to spend a lot more time looking at that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Lori? Yeah, I was just going to add, um, I guess, two points to that. One is it's kind of the opposite of the law of large numbers, right? When you have a smaller number of women, so it's kind of like in you're going to hire a consulting company. Nick, nobody ever got fired for hiring, you know, McKinsey or Deloitte, or if you're doing a big search, like no one ever got fired for, you know, for hiring Spencer Stewart or Egon Zender or Corn Ferry to do a big search. It's sort of like, it's okay to, you know, it's, it's a good, safe thing to do. It's sort of like promoting men, like the whole, I mentioned the you guys thing, like he's a great guy sort of thing. Like, you know, it's like, it's not that risky to promote a man, but when people are talking about, when there's fewer women, so then you're talking about promoting women, promoting women of color, you know, people tend to focus more on it. And think about women CEOs that have failed. Everybody talks about that they're women CEOs, right? Remember Marissa Mariah or Yahoo, like nobody talked about just that it was a one of many CEOs who happened to not turn around a big media company, right? It was always this woman CEO, woman CEO. So it's the kind of it's the 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 dearth of women in these very senior positions. It sort of feeds upon itself that people feel like they have to have that added level of scrutiny mm. before they um, promote women. One other thing I was just going to add: you mentioned the boardroom, and we all do sit on corporate boards. There was a study done, I don't remember who did it, but it basically talked about, so a lot of companies are adding one woman to the board, which is like a check the box. We have to have at least one woman on the board. The so-and-so teacher's pension fund won't invest in us if we don't have a woman on the board. So what they say is one woman on the board, just a token. Two women on the board, women start to sort of feel their power and presence. And it's only really when you have three women at the on the board that women really start to achieve their full potential on, on the board. It's interesting. They have the psychological safety, they feel their voice, they feel supported. And it makes sense based on some of the other things that we've seen. And you say, well, that's crazy. Why would you have three women on the board? Well, there's nine people on a board or 11 people on the board or even seven. It would not be crazy that three of them would be women, as you said, representing 51% of the population. Yeah. See? No, I, I think that the, um, I, 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 I've been sitting out at a board and I was at one point one of the, the only female just because of somebody else had dropped off and now I'm like one of three. And there is, you definitely, you do feel 
it does feel different. I mean, versus just kind of being the only one, because when you're the only one, you definitely feel like, gosh, you don't want everything you say to assume like, oh, she's always going to go down the female path or whatever. So I think that is, I definitely um, can completely relate to that. And it is interesting. I'm, I run the corporate uh, governance committee for our, the board I'm on. It's a public insurance company. And, you know, there's all these, you know, rules coming down the pike over, you know, like, you know, with act through NASDAQ and SEC of actually being able to hit a 30, you know, they're you have 30 percent of your of your board so in some cases you know the the having three is not going to cut it because there's many boards that actually have you know 11 12 13 members so i think that's uh you know very positive i hate well, to think that we're mandated to get there but i think it's a positive <laughs> so katie winding it all the way back to one of your earliest comments it's the that what you call it, the broken rung mckenzie yeah. Yeah. yeah it kind of remind me of like basically it's compound interest yeah right? the earlier yes. you start Right? Exactly. And, and so that you're kind of reaping the non-benefits of not investing early enough. And and boy, that translates to salary too, right? You start looking at the wage sure. gap and, you know, if you compound the fact that you're not getting promoted as fast and you might be getting a slightly lower percentage increase when you do, it's, I mean, the math is pretty, pretty simple. Well, well the, the other thing that y'all were making me think about is in the book where we talk about the talent meeting. Right. Mm -hmm. And that that bias actually can go across genders. And it's like, mm -hmm. well, but Sarah's, you know, just had her second baby. So I'm not really sure, you know, and making all these assumptions. Yes. yes. About yes. people's lives and what they want and what they're capable of and et cetera. And in those, you think about some of those very formative, like there's a lot going on in people's lives. Yes. Right. Yes. And decisions being made for them based uh -huh. on bad assumptions. Yes. Yeah. Let they, me remember the name of the chapter. And at some point, um, I, I just want to make Bob to amplify something that you said. <clears throat> we take the attitude in the book, and I still take it in my life, which is assume positive intent, right? Like, I don't think men are waking up in the morning saying, like, I'm going to ask Susan to take the notes. And so I'm going to keep women down in society. I don't think most men are saying, like, oh, there's a baby shower. I'll just ask the woman VP to plan the baby shower, and I'll ask the men to be on the MA task force. I really don't think it's premeditated. I think a lot of it is unconscious. But the point that you just raised is a great one, right? Those key people planning meetings, most times when people say, oh, we'd love to offer, you know, Jane that job, but her, she just had her second baby and her husband is a big hedge fund in New York. Like they'll never move to Chicago. They're actually doing it out of place of caring. I don't think they're doing it to hold women back, but the net result is it does hold women back because you're making assumptions for people that you should not be making on their behalf. Exactly. And women do it too. It's not just men that do it. Well, but that, that, that was one of the points that, that I gleaned too, is in why I said sort of goes across Totally. Uh, gender yeah. but, but again, to your, to your point, it's unintended. It, it, somehow okay. it's natural. It's unintended, but maybe not very helpful. Yes. yes. You know, one point I guess I'd add is we were talking about the broker run theory that we have a chapter called Be Like Bill, which is, you know, guys kind of come in very confident. They're like they, they'll apply for jobs if they fulfill four of the 10 requirements. They're like, yeah, I, I'm going to apply for it. Women would take it as rules. If they don't hit 10 out of 10, they might not apply. And yeah data that would show that women apply for like 20% less jobs. And, and they're like, maybe they don't want to showcase, you know, they don't want to look like they're showing off. So maybe they're not pushing the results as much. I mean, there's all these various things that are built into it. And I can think of t um, times when early in my career, I was always, I was excited when I got my first job out of graduate school, I thought I was getting paid a lot of money. And now I compared that to, I had been working in a bike shop. So of course anything was going to look good. Like, but, but at that point, every time I got promoted, I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Now I'm like, gosh, now I'm bonus eligible. And I was always so thankful. I'm like, oh my God, now I'm an assistant. Now I'm an associate. Now I'm an... And I feel like I noticed my, the male peers were always mad. Like, gosh, I'm not getting promoted quickly enough. The raises are too small. And we just had very different attitudes. And and I feel like had I, early in my career, had I had a little bit of that, like, would I be, would I have, um, you know, move quicker? Because the fact that it, when it got to, the end of the year and they could only promote one person or only have so much for raises. I'm sure they're like, oh, she's going to be happy regardless of what we give her. Let's have her wait one more year. You know, Bob's going to quit. And so I'm sure that I was absolutely, because I had this very positive attitude, I'm sure it played against me at times because of the fact that I, I think they knew I was going to be kind of happy with, 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 you know, regardless of what, what the situation was. I mean, I was treated fairly, but I feel like I could have, I think, I, I think that I'm sure that that played against me. You, you know, tying two th points uh, that you guys are making. One is, you know, the potential versus performance, 
dynamic, which I, that that's a new one for me that, that, that is super helpful. But I think it ties very into something that we do talk about on this podcast pretty regularly, which is that application rate where men are like, well, I've only got 60% of it. But yeah. Intuitively, they're going, well, I've got the potential though. Yeah. Right? And women yeah. are going, well, I don't have all the performance to tick every box, so I shouldn't apply for this role. Yeah. And, and yeah. then it becomes very self-reinforcing, which yes. again is a negative loop, basically. Yeah. yeah. And I think one of the things we need to be a little careful taking out of this, and even and we tread pretty carefully in that chapter, and in our whole theme of the book, is telling women they need to do things differently. Because part of this is there's... Um, women have been told to, we've been told to lean in a little to perhaps, you know, more than is helpful at times. So part of this is, yes, there are things that you can do as a woman to make sure that you are not, you are not being taken advantage of at the workplace. You're accepting, you're, you're too gracious in your, in the acceptance of your race. But at the same time, I think it's a, the company wide, I think, uh, need to recognize that you can't just reward or focus on the one side. So it's, and I'm, I don't know if I'm saying it that well, but it can't just be like, okay, women need to act more like men mm -hmm. and, you know, kind of apply when they're only 60%. There's probably a middle ground here, right? Like mm -hmm. maybe we all apply when we've got 75% of yeah. this, <laughs> you know, so there's, there's some blending. Well, well, Katie, you kind of bring me to something that I want to talk about. This has all the potential in the world to be a third rail question. So <laughs> I'll caveat it that way. But but do you guys believe that there fundamentally are differences between men and women? And if so, is that a good thing? Or should we be striving for a gender agnostic mindset? Like, like where, yeah. where should this be going? I'll um I'll jump in first on this. We're going to let Lori take that third rail. <laughs> this is the part. So I mentioned that I do executive coaching. So whenever there's a question that's like a little dicey, all of a sudden, Thelma and Louise get very quiet. And they're like, we're going to let Lori. <laughs> Come we're back, seeing, Steve. We're seeing all her turtlenecks. Um, so, yeah. So I have a, a fairly, I, I guess, a fairly strong opinion on this, which is, I, and I'll use the example, and this is not what you were saying when people say like, I don't see color. It's mm -hmm. like, yes, you do. And that's, that's good. And it's like, you know, uh, so I don't think it's a question of trying to say that we should, uh, you know, not see gender, uh, that I think we should recognize that in general, there are differences. One thing that I would say though is, so a word, uh, or a way that it was described to me years ago. Remember, I don't know if you remember the book, Men Are From Mar Mars, Women Are From, Venus. from but Venus. But what it really talks about, it's not really men and women. Like all women have some traditionally feminine process and then we have some masculine process in it and men have some masculine process or feminine process. So, so whatever you call it, process, traits, whatever it is. But I think we each have some of each. And sometimes, I'll use an example back in, the early 90s, there was a syringe crisis at Pepsi. Some consumer stuck a syringe in a can of Pepsi or Diet Pepsi. It was a whole big thing. And the person who was our president at the time, Craig Weatherup, and he handled the situation incredibly, incredibly well. But people talked about there were times during that, it was probably a week or two week long situation where he had to use a very masculine kind of process. He had to take control. He was commanding. He like went on CNN at the time. This is early 90s. And he was very sort of traditional masculine process, very commanding. He also um, like went to a very feminine part of his process, which was a very nurturing thing when he was with our company. Right. So he did a lot of internal meetings, let people know our company was in a little bit of a crisis. He understood he was caring. He knew people were uh, were nervous and it was, you know, it was a disconcerting time. So he pulled on the different tools in his toolkit, some of which were more masculine process and some of which were more traditionally feminine process. So what I think is we each have a little bit of both and we have to know that workplaces are the best 
when you have diversity of style, diversity of background, you have strategists, you have people that are more execution minded, you have people who are into words and pictures and storytelling and some that are really motivated by, you know, numbers. And you have men, you have women, you have older people, you have younger people, right? You have people that grew up in the Midwest, you have people that are from New York. I mean, you have Jews, you have Christians, you have gay, you have straight. Those are the best workforces when you have diversity. So I am more of a of the point of view of let's celebrate the differences rather than try and pretend there are no differences. And last thing I would say on that, there are men that you meet that bring much more of like traditional feminine process things to the table and some women that bring much more sort of masculine process things to the table. And that's okay. That's part of the diversity. See, Katie, do y'all like that? Um, yeah, I, I would say, I think uh, it's just so hard to, it, it's hard when you try and say there's just, you know, all men are one way, all women are, are one way, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's so many differences within each. It gets challenging when you ascribe characteristics and traits to each one. That's where it gets complicated. And that's where we still are. Um, so I think that should that's an effort to move to move away. I read I saw this one thing. It's an effort that needs to be done. I saw this one, I read this one thing about there was a company where there was a woman CEO and somebody had done a study, and, and we talk in the book about the importance of language in the workplace and gendered language and things like that. And in this um, in, in this one company, they found with the woman as CEO, the words that were used in reviews, dot hers, it started to trickle through the organization. They were using more kind of positive leadership types of words that are more often associated with men for women throughout the organization. Mm -hmm. So it's just a really interesting mm -hmm. point in that the representation translated into the language and it started to cross those traditional gender boundaries. So I've mm -hmm. kind of got, so I just, I think it's really hard when you get into those, those kind of like male versus female conversations, because there's so much difference. There's probably more difference within than there is between. Yes. Us. Yes. Yes. Well, I was going to say, I think that there's, so I think I agree with Lori's point of like a diversity of thought and, and points of view is, is great. And I think that's one thing that's interesting is even within the band of sisters, the six of us, we have, you know, huge diversity, just even the, between the three of us. I mean, I'm gay. They're kind of boring straight people. Um, <laughs> boring you know, straight people. That's boring. what you're saying under my name, boring straight people. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we got, we got Christians, we got Jews, we got, we got, you know, Lori has kids, Katie has stepkids, I have no kids, you know, I mean, it's just, I'm cool, they're not, I mean, they're just a diverse <laughs> But well, that was apparent, you didn't need to say that last one, but okay. See, when you have to say it out loud, you know, I, mean, <laughs> I know. You have to do a handstand, see. Um, yeah. <laughs> but but one of our friends uh, of Career Club is um, Johnny Taylor Jr., who's the CEO of SHRM, uh, mm -hmm. Society of Human Resources Management, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, we were talking about this exact issue, and it was around, well, more broadly, diversity, which yeah. implies difference. And so, Lori, like, I'm way deep in your camp once, you know, differences are good and to be yeah. celebrated, right? And yes. Johnny is like... So be careful what you wish for, first of all, because when you get yes. diversity, you get diversity and yes. not everybody falls in line and thinks the exact same way, particularly yes. on hot button issues. Yes. Right? And so, you know, my question for him was, so what's the solve on that? And I think you guys would agree with this, but it's around civility and respect. Yes. And, and, and Lori, you know, I'm very deep in your camp on assume good intent. Yes. Right. Yes. And, and, and so we don't need to go on a, a huge trail of how, you know, uh, polemic, you know, social conversation has gotten. But just the fact yeah. that if if we find what unites us together, right? So if we work at a company, like what's the mission of the company? Do we have a shared vision? You yeah. know, we bought into the purpose of the company. Now, bringing different ways and understanding of different constituents that we might be serving, stakeholders, right, that we might be after. Um, there you go, Matt. Thank you. Good job. Um, <laughs> Matt is a good guy, by the way. Um, but but the diversity, it, I, I often liken it to a quilt, 
right? And, and yeah. colors are beautiful because there's all these patches of color and pattern and difference. And individually, they can be beautiful. But when they're brought together, it's this very unique work of art yeah. right, that we all love. And yeah. so, you know, I'm glad to hear what you said, Lloyd, at least yeah. because it kind of aligns with what I yeah. think about the topic. But I do believe it's true. And I think if we looked at the highest performing companies, mm -hmm. that's what we would find over time. Yeah. The other thing, I just read an article recently on this, which was that unlike a mosaic, like on a quilt, which is just sort of beautiful and calming to look at all the diversity of the patches, when you're operating in a diverse workplace, there's a natural sort of, I don't want to say tension there, but like to get to um, realize all the productivity from diversity, it means that you're not going to all see things the same way, right? Yeah. Gender diversity, diversity of style, background. So there's a little bit of natural conflict that comes from that, which can feel uneasy when you're not used to it. But it's actually getting through that conflict productively and debating the issues productively that gets you to a better run company. When we first started working, there was something that they said when you were going out on recruiting and you would say, well, how do I judge or whatever? And they literally said the Pittsburgh airport test, like if you got stuck in the airport with someone for seven hours, pick somebody that you would want to spend time with, which is the it's antithetical to diversity. Right. Because that's how you get a lot of the like, oh, you know, the we went to Cho together. We were in Sigma Chi together. We were you know went to Darien Country Club together. Like there's a lot of sort of sameness of people that are just like you, that it's easy to spend time with. Mm -hmm. And what you want is, again, all productively, but no, people challenge your assumptions. They help you see maybe where you have some underlying bias. That a little bit of that, you know, kind of making things a little uncomfortable is what makes things better. Exactly. It's exactly. just harder. It's harder. That, I mean, so it's kind of natural that people veer towards easier, more comfortable paths. So you just have to recognize that it's going to be harder. It's, you can't really sugarcoat that. It just is. Yeah. Well, let's do a little bit of a double click because you know the book has got 30 something examples of these kinds of things that happen in the workplace. And uh, I think I told you guys offline, like almost immediately when I was like, uh, <laughs> and I'm gonna blame this a little bit on my Southerness but, you know, talking about the girl in accounting, I would never talk about the boy in accounting. Yes. Ever. Ever. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. Like, okay. <laughs> but, but it's true. And, and you know, did I, 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 I almost sent you guys an email this morning that started with, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was great. Um, but, but maybe if we could pick on, and maybe we could do one each or however you guys want to do this. But, yeah. but but like a very common one or or even an insidious one, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And, and then how you why it matters, and then maybe how from those three perspectives, yeah. if this is happening to you, if you're the boss, if you witness this. So yeah. once again, I'll, I'll, I'll start. I'll start with actually the, you hit on one of my favorite chapters, which is you know you know who's the new girl, and it's this, we do use the word girl a lot. Have you met the new girl in accounting? We just hired a new girl out of Harvard. Um, and again, you just cannot, you cannot say it the other way. If, if you, I've actually, one of my techniques is I'll actually say like, Hey, wait, 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 Bob, just say the same sentence. If it wasn't, it was, if it was, you know, John and not the Susan, you were talking about it. And they try to say, Oh, we just hired a new boy out of Harvard and they just can't, they start laughing. So, and I think uh, words matter, sets the tone. Um, a lot of this language can be very minimizing. Um, I think if ma male colleagues think of their female colleagues as girls, I hardly think of them Oh, they're going to take them serious as a candidate for like the CEO slate. So I think it really sets, sets a tone. Um, the, and there's other, you know, girl is one example. There's a lot of other uh, gendered language. A lot of the male leaning language is usually more positive. Uh, man up, man power, gentleman's agreement, you know, two guys in a garage talking about a startup with women. It can be like, you know, throw like a girl, uh, Debbie Downer, diva, or, you know, like, is, is the simple, you know, when you're talking about innovation and you have a screen of like, is this simplest, simple uh, enough that your your mother can understand it as though that's the, that's the lowest common denominator. So I think words and tone really make a difference. 
um, how you approach it. I think if it's if you know this, you know, the, 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 you could spend a whole hour on this just topic alone. Um, any of these, but for me, I would generally kind of ad address it right there in the in the meeting. If someone said something, I would do it in a jokey way. That would be my style. I think Lori would probably maybe go behind that's you know behind the scenes and say, hey, you know, after the meeting, you might mention something and do it. That that, that would be more her her style, or maybe right up the point of emphasize when they say, have you met the new girl in account and be like, oh, I have, the, I have met the new woman in account and she's great. I heard she, you know, and you kind of just try to kind of maybe kind of, you know, be a good, good role model there. I think for a boss or leader, definitely pay attention. You don't do it yourself. And if you hear other people do it, correct it the same way, whether maybe you're like, oh, actually the new woman that in accounting was you know, blah, 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 or pull them aside. And if you're a witness, the same thing, I think the witnesses are, you're, you're, you're going to, that's the one that's the most people are going to be witnesses. You're going to be in the room when these things, things happen. And I think, you know, be a good role model, try to call it out, try to help, you know, emphasize again, people, positive intent, people aren't trying to do this. And how do we, how do we, do, how do we um, help shape it? Mm. Lori, what so, pops in your mind? Yeah, so uh, so C's C's favorite is the one about girls. I have um, there's a chapter that I uh, that I like uh, called Great Idea Greg. And this scenario, mm -hmm. just to set the stage, this is you're in a meeting. Assume you're a woman or you know someone underrepresented, and you say something, you say something, you say something, and then five minutes later, usually you know a white man will say the same thing, and they're like, "Great idea, Greg!" And you you just like your your head wants to explode because you're like, "I just literally said that." So that's the thought bubble in your head. But because it's work, not home, you can't stand up and go, "I just literally said that." James, if that were the name of your husband, for example. Um, so I think that so we all have our sort of like, you have to have your, you know, your behavior on at work. So in that particular situation, that great idea, Greg, and one of the things I would say about this by way of background is, I think we talked about this at the beginning, like one of the key things in inclusion and belonging is, um, is people feeling like they matter, that their voice is heard. I mean, at a really sort of a very high level. So think about this great idea, Greg, you're talking, you have ideas and someone is just skipping right over you and then giving credit to somebody else 10 minutes later. So that's the background. In terms of what you do on that, so if it's you, so if you're the one that is talking and you feel like they've just stepped over you and then they say, great idea, Greg, you can do a couple of things. I mean, you can speak up, you can, if it isn't being heard, you can use the chat if you're on a Zoom, for example, right? But the other thing you can do is preempting. So remember, there's things you can do in the moment, but there's also preempting and what you can do after the fact. So this is one of these things that usually doesn't happen once. It usually happens over and over again. And so sometimes what you can do is you can go to allies before the meeting and say, hey, I would love it if you could have my back in the meeting. If you hear me saying something and it's not being heard, I would love it if you can help me. So sometimes you can preempt the issue. Sometimes you can be very surgical about where you sit. You can sit in the front, you can speak first. Sometimes when you're not being heard, I will literally, I'll go up to the whiteboard and I'll just write something on the whiteboard. So there's a lot of things you can do if it's you, if you're an ally in the room, what I would encourage you to do is ally of any gender is 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 amplify and give credit. So when you know Lori says something, Lori says something, Lori said something, no one says anything, right? And then 10 minutes later, Greg says it and they say, great idea, Greg. You can say, Greg, I, I love what you're saying. And I'd love to go back to, you know, what Lori brought up a few minutes ago on that, right? So bring it back to what Lori did and amplify what Lori did. I wouldn't advise saying, Lori sent that 10 minutes ago. Like that's just not that productive, but there's a way that you can amplify. Thank you, Greg. And Lori, can you go back to what you started a few minutes ago? I would love for you to continue on that point that you were making about the new manufacturing facility in Des Moines. So again, what you can do as the woman, what you can do as a, as a person in the room. And then I think if you're a boss, one piece of advice that I would give that goes across a lot of these scenarios is pay attention, not just to the content of the meeting, but to the dynamics of the meeting. So pay attention to who's speaking, when they're speaking, who's getting credit. Bosses tend to focus a lot on the actual content. What are the financials? What, when are we going to open the new facility in Des Moines, et cetera? And that's very, very important. But I think bosses have to play, uh, they have to play two games at once. So they have to be able to do that and they have to be able to focus on the dynamics of the meeting. 
So super quick, we, uh, a few months ago, we had David Taylor, who's the uh -huh. retired CEO from Procter. And I love David Taylor. And that, that was really kind of one of the big lessons coming out of yes. that chat was he really felt like a lot of his role was the dynamics and making yes. sure that people were being heard. And then, yes. you know, not even being responsible for synthesizing all of it, because yeah. you know, one of his expressions is none of us is better than all of us. I love that. Isn't that good? And, yeah. but, but just really being cognizant of making sure that people are participating irrespective mm -hmm. of level of the company, mm -hmm. functional area that's less sexy or yeah. whatever it might be, or gender in this case, yes. but really making sure that people felt like that they were being heard. Otherwise people shut down. And it's like, yes. well, why am I even here? Right? Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Katie, but what, what's a good example for you? So one of the areas that we talk about, and we've actually got two chapters that kind of touch in this general area in the book is around um, office housework and um, uh, the kind of non-promotable or non-essential work that women tend to get, um, they get put in those roles. The easier, the easy ones to identify and I think call out are the, you know, taking the notes, um, setting up parties and, um, you know, any of that kind of office housework stuff with you're continually being asked to do that. Some of the ones that we've, that we've seen and heard more about during the, um, during the pandemic is who sets up the next Zoom call. So it's these administrative tasks that, that just tend to go towards not just the lowest level person in the room, but tends to go towards the women. So that's one, that's one area, a related area and possibly I think a more insidious and problematic area is the, um, this kind of culture work, the, the good, we call this good soldier type, type work. And that is women. And, and this is happening a lot to people of color in organizations these days is being put on these culture task forces. Like we want to make sure that we are as inclusive as possible. So we need you to take 25% of your week now and help us do it better. And I mean, it's all, it's all fine. And actually this is more data that, that comes out in the McKinsey study as well, that this is, and it, it takes a lot of time. Um, it can be very good for the company, right? It has very good results for the company. But then if you're not rewarded for it and you're not promoted for it or it's considered non-promotable work, there we go again, right? It's just kind of another, it's another little off-ramp. Um, and that's just, it's something that women, allies and leaders all need to be aware of. Um, for And for women, so if it's you, I, I mean, I can remember, gosh, being in, in meetings where it just would drive me crazy. Like the women would stay and clean up after lunch. And, and I just, I just steeled myself to walk out. I mean, I felt like a jerk, but I walked out because the guys were walking out. Now I took care of my own trash. And, but like, I just, I refused to perpetuate that idea that the women are going to stay back and do. So for, so there's, that's the, the more house housekeeping type thing. Um, when it's, you know, you're asked to be on a culture task force, you're asked to run the United Way or something like that, that uh, there's a little bit more of a, sometimes it's the right thing to do. Other times you can say things like, gee, that would be, I would love to be on that. I'm already on this one and that one. And I've got, you know, these three other projects that have the time, the time sensitivity. Can I take some of the pressure off one of those timelines? And so it's kind of a, a, a more um, gentle way of, of managing your workload and, and, and helping somebody get you to a decision where it happens to somebody else. So that's, that's one thing is, is different ways to say no and how directly you can do that. I think for leaders, you really have to look at who you are volunteering or as Lori likes to say, voluntolding to do <laughs> things and make sure that you are, you are not putting, you know, your five favorite guys on the m and task force and you're putting women on the, you know, kind of culture and party task forces. You have mm -hmm. to be really careful with that. And allies, this is a little bit trickier for an ally maybe, but you can volunteer. You can be, you can be like, you could look around and say, gosh, C's had to do the United Way drive the last three years. I've never been asked to do it. I'm going to, I'm going to step up and volunteer to do it this year um, or, or point something out. But there are things that everybody can do there. Mm -hmm. And I mean, Worst case or best case, I guess, is 
you decide that, okay, if this is an important enough thing, like the M&A task force, I'm going to put it on your review as a deliverable. And if you hit it out of the park, then you're going to get credit for it. And you're going to get promoted because of it. So if you get that to me is it needs to be seen as valuable work if you're going to be putting your time into yeah, it. Yeah. The, the, the phrase that popped in my head as you were describing that, Katie, it's a career tax. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah, right? that's a good one. Yeah, because if if you're being asked to do this stuff and it's not measurable, compensatable, rewardable, promotable, then mm -hmm. basically it's a tax. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I've still got to get all my other crap done. And oh, by the way, I I'm going to probably get promoted on performance. And you guys just laid this 25 percent time commitment. Yeah. On. So, so we're not supposed to get all this done. It's more compounding, right? Of the yeah. same. Exactly. Of the same basic thing. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so I, I wanted to kind of wanted to test something, see if you guys would agree with this. And then I'm going to get to my last question here in a sec. But as, as I kind of took in, you know, everything, and again, highly, highly recommend this is awesome, <laughs> is three words that just really kind of came to me as sort of if I had to put a wrapper around all of this was empathy, respect, mm -hmm. and trust. Mm -hmm. oh, those are good ones. You know, but because the, mm -hmm. the empathy is like, well, how would that feel if somebody asked me or said that to me or or y'all talk about counting the room? I actually yeah. count the room a lot in reverse. Good. Right? Mm -hmm. I'm very, that's great. and I have been for a long time. That, that's something that comes natural to me. I'm like, oh, wow, mm -hmm. I bet she probably feels kind of weird or he feels kind of weird as the only person of color mm -hmm. in this meeting or whatever and mm -hmm. trying to make people feel included yeah so so that, that that's an easy one for me respect i mean that gets back to word choice c that you talked about mm -hmm. uh, i never thought of the concept katie of office housework before and as soon as i read yeah. it i'm like oh my gosh yes mm -hmm. you know hey, can you get the bagels and the coffee who's going to take the notes you know cleaning up afterwards like all that stuff as soon as i read i'm like oh my gosh like i i can completely yeah. think of a thousand examples of where that that's true right but but it's very disrespectful at mm -hmm. the same time, right? Because I'm too okay. important. I'm going to go off and do my thing and you can go do that. Uh -huh. But ultimately, ultimately, I think that it comes down to trust, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, kind of just on the, you know, good old boys network and, and all that stuff, it's mm -hmm. like, well, I, it's just easier for me to trust somebody who's more like me, mm -hmm. right? And if I don't put the effort forward to try and understand, show a level of respect, assume good intent, blah, 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 mm -hmm. then it's like, well, then I'm going to go to my easier default behavior and just go mm -hmm. to somebody who's more like me. Yeah. That's fair? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know? yeah. So well, anyway. and, the, and, and look at it, the higher up you get, the more like more people like you there are around you. It actually gets reinforced as you move up. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so, so. So what, let's let's use this because I, I told you all from the very beginning the main reason I wanted to have you guys on, yeah, you know, was for my daughter. So Christina's thirty-two. She's got her MBA. She's you know works a very you know uh, important job at her company and has a lot of responsibility. And just as a father, like you know, it would it drives me insane to think that like she's you know on the receiving end mm -hmm. of this kind of stuff right and and i i'm not going to say things that i know to be true but would be very in line with what we're talking mm -hmm. about worse um but but since she's you know on a on a trail that you guys you know have been on in, in some ways not too long ago you know what's the best advice that you would give christina to not just survive to thrive in her mm -hmm. career and in women like Christina? I'll, I'll start. I think one thing I would tell Christina as well as my younger self is kind of the importance of the of building relationships and in, in, um, in kind of informal ways and how far that goes, which I think men happens much more naturally, whether it's in the, in the locker room or playing basketball or golf or going out to dinner, having drinks or talk before the meeting. And, and I think in some cases, women are not necessarily as easily included in that. In some cases, they're not golfing or not as often. They might not be going out and having drinks or whatever. But there even could be like, hey, you're in the pre-meeting, the pre-conversation before the meeting starts. I mean, there's all these different times that you could be, you, you could kind of be involved. I think initially, 
if I wasn't included in some of that stuff, naturally, I'd, I'd put my head down and be like, well, I'm just going to get through three more emails and do two more texts. And I was thought I'm going to be productive while these guys are not being productive. And I think in the long run, I would have been way more productive. I would have been better off building relationships and trust such that I was being put on the task force and naturally being picked and whatever. And I think that that I think that people women don't put as much emphasis on that of how important it is building these relationships and trust and conversations that will play pay dividends throughout their careers. So mm -hmm. I did it, but I feel like I could have done it sooner. Mm -hmm. Katie? So, you know, I remember sitting at an intern lunch when I was probably just a little bit younger than your daughter is now, and Roger Enrico was running mm -hmm. um, Frito-Lay at the time. And he said, and I'm, I, I, I think I've paraphrased it really poorly over the years, but this is how I remember it now. And this, this is actually not even specific to women. I think it's really good career advice that, you know, when he, and, and it was getting at his, his trajectory, had he had taken himself off the beaten path. Um, but when he came back, he, he didn't do what you were supposed to do in those days to what was the next most, you know, the, the place to be, the assignment to have, the thing to do to, to advance. He went a different path. And he said, you know, as long as you're doing something that is, you know, growing you, you're interested in your learning and you're moving ahead, you stay. The minute any one of those things starts to go away, you leave. And and it was it was in response to a question about, you know, kind of like career path and career trajectory and things like that. And I thought it was, to me, it was super useful because, you know, it was, and even in my own career, it was going on small assignments and small brands where I could make an impact, not looking for the big, you know, kind of the big showy job that sounded good, but was in reality, not the best place to be. Um, and, and then, you know, kind of fulfilling your own personal interests and um, curiosity. So I, I thought that was really, really useful advice. I think that it requires, a. I, I also think there's a little bit of patience. You want to do the job that you're doing really well and not worry about the next job. But I think with women, you have to be careful about having too much patience. So there's that in-between thing, right? Um, you don't, and I think for men and women, you don't want to be the person who's never content where they are. But at the same time, you, so there's a judgment there. And, and I think, you know, for women, err a little bit maybe on impatience and get to a place that values you and moves you and gives you things that are curious. And a big part of that, and we talk about it in the book, and it's the, I think we can all credit, is making sure you've got a sponsor. Um, so that's kind of, that's all wrapped up in there. And, um, but I think that's, that's can be the most important and critical thing to make sure that you're valued and moving. Yeah. So two things that just sort of strike me. One is it's amazing. And the career conversations, because obviously career club, that's what we're talking about a lot is curiosity that that is probably the yeah. number one trait that continues to bubble up is you have to have a natural curiosity yeah. and, and go exhibit that curiosity. So yes. that's cool. The, the, the sponsor, that's such a, that's such a great suggestion, Katie, because part of what implies that there is implied in that for me is the trust It's like, Hey, I trust this person. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going mm -hmm. to mentor him or her, right. I'm going mm -hmm. to advocate yeah. on their behalf. So I'm going to put my mm -hmm. brand on this person. Yeah. And that's what a brand mm -hmm. is, is trust. Right. And that gets to right. potential, right? Because then the yes. sponsor is more willing to promote right. um, based on potential than performance. And I think right. that's, and that ties back to what C was saying as well, of putting yourself in that position, getting yourself notified, noticed, because that is a requirement of being sponsored. You don't get, you don't, unfortunately, you can't go ask someone to be your sponsor. You have to get right. sponsored. And that requires a level of, um, partly luck, um, but also just making making sure that your work is important and noticed. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Lori, what, what advice would you yeah. give Christina? Um, so the, mine would be around the area of really like understanding your strengths and really figuring out how to play on your strengths. So in, you know, we've been very fortunate. We've worked for wonderful companies, did a lot of leadership training, but part of the downside of that is you spend a lot of time doing development feedback and talking about 
your development needs. And what I try and get people to work on, and I wish I knew this earlier, is take your development needs and get them to standard. Don't spend a second of time trying to make your development needs strength. Like it's just not a good use of your time, right? Make sure they're not getting in the way. So again, get them to standard and then really focus on understanding if you've ever done strength finders or something like that. Look at your strengths. What would they look like if they were towering strains? What are your superpowers? What would it look like something that's a superpower for you? What would it look like if you were the best in the world at that? And how could you use that to your advantage um, in your chosen career? I think we spend too much time and too much airtime focusing on people's development needs or weaknesses. And I really wish I had spent less airtime, less mind time worrying about that and just being able to say, oh, here's a development need that I'm working on, boom, get it to standard, and then really spend airtime, energy, effort focusing on my, um, on my strengths. Well, I appreciate you saying that. It's ironic because we've uh, incorporated strength finders into our it. process with all of our clients. Because I love that. my observation is people tend to be not sufficiently self-aware yeah. of what their strengths are. And even to the extent they are, they often lack the vocabulary yes. to yes. advocate for themselves yes. yeah. right, of what their strengths yes. are. Right. Yes. And then, you know, if you think about what's a team, not everybody plays the same role on a team, yes. right? So yes. I'm the big dude that can block people. I'm the guy that can throw the ball 50 yards down the field. Great. We have different strengths. Let's go yeah. play to those strengths. So that's cool. Yeah. Super quick, because I want to respect Lindsay's question here. Does the book get into any of the details about how to read the room and the dynamics of a meeting? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if we go into a lot of specifics about how to do it. We certainly talk about that pre-meeting, yeah. um, the pre-meeting chit-chat, the understanding the three parts of a meeting, the pre, the during, and the post, and also the importance of understanding the power networks in your company um, and where and how decisions really get made. Yeah. But it's, yeah, that's, that's to the best of my knowledge um, where we hit it. Yeah, okay. and it really cool. differs dramatically by company, right? Yeah. In some companies, like they break a lot of eggs in the meeting, they have really robust conversations. Some companies are very like all the decisions happen before and after yeah. and the meetings are very symbolic. So you have to understand how the culture, which is what's unwritten, how things actually happen in your company. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, to your earlier point, Katie, we could talk seven hours just on that <laughs> stuff. So this has been phenomenal. I mean, we can like Heather, this conversation is so important. Thank you so much for taking the time to share your knowledge and experiences. Like people want to feel valued and appreciated. That that's what Heather's saying. And by the way, she works with us at Career Club. So um, so I'm glad she feels that way. And Sarah Kirby, good to see you. Thank you. Um, so on the screen here is uh, the cover of the book. Uh, you should smile more as well as a QR code that take you right to Amazon to be able to buy it. Highly recommend it. It was a real eye opener for me. I probably need to reread it, honestly, to kind of fully synthesize, you know, a lot of these things and internalize them. But, you know, I just so much appreciate you guys being on today. Thank you so much. And like I said, you know, a big part of this was for my daughter. So really, really appreciate everything that you guys had to share, not just for me, but for her. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Okay. Bless you guys. Thanks so much. Everybody has a great rest Thanks, of your everybody. week and we'll see you next week. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye.